and uh, thank yeah. you to uh, both uh, Dr. Ranjit Sani and uh, Mrs. Indu Sani for having me. Here. I think it's a great pleasure. Um, I had to really think hard on what should I really talk about today to uh, a bunch of young aspiring students um, who are both interested in the stock market, but yet I have a long, long way to go also to build a career out there. So I just thought I'll, I'll uh, kind of uh, spend two, three minutes in terms of my own background, uh, what I've done, and then I'll quickly jump on to the uh, topic. So I, 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 as, as doctor said, I've kind of come from Calcutta, did my college in uh, Calcutta in a college called St. Xavier's College, extremely interesting format. Uh, unlike the rest of the country, college starts at six in the morning, finishes at nine in the morning. You have the entire day to kind of go out and uh, start working. Uh, so really didn't have a happening college life, except for the fact that uh, got out and became a small entrepreneur myself uh, at an early age. Uh, started a small travel agency uh, while I just about started college. And that taught me a lot because uh, in those days, uh, capital was uh, extremely, extremely critical uh, to run a travel agency successfully. And uh, having a massive lack of capital uh, basically meant two things. You either needed to discount your tickets massively or you needed to go out and um, get very, very high cost capital. Uh, those days, uh, going out and selling in uh, uh, hardcore streets of Calcutta, like Ezra Street and uh, College Street, for those of you who are familiar, really teaches you the art of uh, uh, bargaining to the core. And to a certain extent, uh, in, in, in many ways for me, those were my formative years where I really learned hard on how to negotiate. Uh, spent two years there, couldn't scale up the travel agency business massively uh, because capital was always, always going to be key. Uh, eventually kind of decided to do something different. And when I started figuring out what is the best different thing which I can do, I figured out education uh, in some ways was the shortest cost possible to take in India. And when I looked across the entire education space, there was this immense uh, value to being from an IM. And um, suddenly I figured out that if you get into an IM, you can jump at least two or three uh, positions and effectively uh, join join the firm you were aspiring to join um, in at least two, three notches higher than what you had initially planned. So I started working hard for uh, uh, giving CAT and uh, the third year of my college life more or less devoted towards uh, really working hard to prepare uh, for that exam. And uh, as things were to happen, I worked hard for it and um, uh, I think uh, got lucky. Uh, I am Bangalore is where I ended up in the year 99. Uh, being from Calcutta, hitting I am Bangalore, uh, the first six months were really, really kind of uh, uh, atrocious because uh, meeting even uh, students from Bombay and Delhi was a bit of a confidence dampener coming from Calcutta. And uh, the biggest competition we had in the first three, four months uh, was whether our typing speed was fast enough. Uh, we were hardly exposed to computers way back in Cal. And uh, the students from mostly SRCC, HR College, everywhere in Bombay and Delhi were much smarter, more confident. Uh, but in some ways, it was really a transformative two years for me, uh, not from an education perspective alone, but even from a personality development perspective. And it made us much more confident, got the opportunity to go for an exchange program to a school called Isade in Barcelona. And uh, that was a great four months in the second year and uh, uh, got to travel whole, whole of Europe as a backpack student back then. And in some ways, it was very, very interesting because I got my job offer there and I was supposed to join a company called uh, Diamond Cluster International. Uh, which was kind of the equivalent of McKinsey in financial services and consulting. Uh, opted out of the final campus placements and uh, as luck was to have it, it was a great year of placements that year because we essentially got placed in 2001 before the crisis started. And as life was to have it, uh, you had September 11 in 2001 and the Twin Tower attack. And even before I ended up in Spain, uh, uh, my visa took long to come and even before I ended up in Spain, I essentially got uh, kind of laid off. Uh, because uh, Diamond Cluster went through a massive consolidation and got bought out by one of the large consulting firms in 2001. And uh, effectively, come back to November 2001, job offers had practically dried up. Uh, I had a pre-placement offer from HSBC where Dharma Summers, they were no longer recruiting. So two years from I am Bangalore and uh, six months post that, pretty much uh, life had come back to ground zero. So in some ways, uh, that's that's the, that's my big that's my story. Uh, 2001, I joined Kotak uh, on the wealth management side for seven years, and then pretty much started out IFL Wealth in 2008. Giving you a very very quick perspective on what in in some senses for me is kind of influenced my uh, last 20 25 years. Okay, so I think uh, in 
or I'll just kind of uh, 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 cut across and try it and lay a framework. I would just kind of use this abbreviation abbreviation clear, okay? Uh, so C, C kind of uh, meaning compounding, L standing for uh, luck, E basically emotions, uh, A asset allocation and R risk, okay? So these are the five things I really want to talk about. And in some ways, these five things have kind of uh, shaped uh, whatever we are today. Uh, the first aspect is compounding, okay? Very early in life, we realize that uh, nothing comes early, okay? Uh, you can only make wealth or grow anything at a certain pace. And you have to be extremely, extremely cognizant to the fact that if anything moves very fast, okay? It's not true and it's not going to be believable. Uh, the power of compounding is something which is very, very important for us to understand. And uh, with the C compounding, I'm going to associate another word called commercial, okay? So if, if, if you want to deal with money, okay, these are two aspects which are extremely, extremely important. Uh, like Dr. Sani pointed out right in the beginning, he's a Sindhi, I'm a Marwadi. So if you want to deal with money, you have to be a little commercial. Okay? So you have, to, you have to like money. Okay? When I say like money, it doesn't mean you give up your friends, your loved ones and only focus on money. But you need to like the pluses and minuses. Okay? So you need to like uh, buying something, selling something. You just, you just need to have some bit of a knack for it. Uh, in my own ways, I had a knack for it because I used to love maths, I used to love numbers, I used to like uh, adding, I used to like multiplying. So it's simple commercial maths. It's not really integration, derivatives, and so on and so forth. But you just need to have some bit of a love for numbers. And that's really what I would kind of call it, having a commercial brain in you. Okay? That's extremely, extremely important for you to be able to like money. Second, obviously, is the power of compounding. Like I said, you know, all of you would have heard about the rule of 72. Um, broadly, 72 divided by the rate of return is the amount of time it takes to double your money in a certain time period. So effectively, for in three years, if you want to double your money, uh, you need to grow it at 24%. And it kind of 100 rupees becomes 200 rupees in three years. Conversely, if it grows at 10% every year, it doubles in seven years, right? Because uh, 72 divided by 10 is effectively seven. A part of compounding is extremely, extremely massive, right? Because uh, it's kind of exponential and exponential has become these, uh, the buzzword with Corona here. But in, in some ways, uh, you know, if you're growing your money at 6% for 30 years versus growing your money at 9% for 30 years, the gap between the two is massive. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not arithmetic, but it's absolutely kind of progressive. And uh, it's very, very difficult. Uh, you know, Warren Buffet, for all, all, all of you who know him, uh, his his money is grown only at 14-15%. Now from the outside, 14-15% might seem very little, but it's grown at 14-15% for the last 35-40 years. Okay? So that's the power. Okay, So for example, if you just do quick maths, 100 rupees growing at 14% for 5 years becomes 200, 10 years it becomes 400, 15 years 18, 800, uh, 20 years 1600, 25 years 3200, and 30 years 6400. Go to the 40th year, it's already become 25,000, okay? So effectively, in a gap of 40 years, he's grown 100 rupees to 40,000, okay? The same money invested in a fixed deposit for the same 40 years, okay, would effectively have grown after 12 years from 100 to 200. Again, another 12 years, 200 to 400. And then another 12 years, 400 to 800. And then 1,000, okay? So the gap is 100 rupees would have grown to 1,000 rupees, okay, in 40 years at the rate of a fixed deposit growing, the same 100 rupees has grown to 40,000 rupees, okay, at a growth rate of 14%. So that's the power of the gap between 6% and 14%. Okay? And in order to re achieve these, these kind of compounded returns, there are certain other aspects which we need to be kind of uh, fairly uh, careful about, which is what I'm going to try and address in the remaining three or four points, right? So I think I'm going to start off with this uh, letter L, okay? And I believe this uh, letter is massively underrated. And I'm going to try and pick out some examples from my life um, on kind of trying to substantiate this point. Okay? And uh, L, like we all know, stands for the word luck. Okay? So whether we like it or not, uh, we, are, we are destined to be lucky if we work harder because it improves our probability of being lucky. But at the same point of time, we need to be lucky. Right? And uh, if I look back in life and I uh, look at the last 20 odd years, I think... Uh, I've been phenomenally lucky, right? So once I graduated from I am Bangalore, uh, I was all set. I don't know how many of you have been to Barcelona, but there's a beautiful hotel called the W Hotel on the beach, okay, which is uh, kind of a uh, 65 year, 65 uh, story tower overlooking the water. And that was supposed to be in my office uh, in 2001. 
um, WTC attacks happened. For six months, um, I was effectively without a job. I got lucky because I was teaching uh, a whole bunch of students uh, to help them prepare for CAT. Uh, I'm calling them students, but they were only a couple of years younger to me. And I was lucky because I ended up meeting my uh, uh, wife there and I was uh, incidentally teaching her. And um, as life was to have it, even if I would have got to Spain, I would have really had a tough three years because technology and internet in Europe just went through uh, through crap between 2001 to 2004. Okay, It was absolutely, absolutely down. And eventually, uh, you, you can only be a cog in a wheel, right? So when we talk about uh, performance and we say, you know, how do you decide performance for a hundred rupee? If you try and attribute a hundred rupees of performance, the first 55, 60% of attribution really comes down to the environment and the industry you are in. Okay? However good you are and, uh, you know, however smart you are, you can't change the entire industry in itself. Okay. So imagine me going as a management trainee just out of campus to telecom consulting in Barcelona, right? And all companies going down under from 2001 to 4. However smart I am, I cannot change the entire industry. On the flip, ended up with a very non-glamorous job uh, with Kotak in 2001 um, on, the, uh, on the wealth management side. Uh, there was nothing called wealth management back in 2001. It was a brokerage firm called Kotak Securities. And essentially, uh, all we needed to do is sell stocks to clients. Okay? One thing I promised myself after my travel agency experiences, uh, one thing I'll never do in life is go and sell again. Okay? And uh, as life was to have it exactly 30 months from that date, from the day I took promise, uh, I was again back selling again. Okay, I thought I'm, you know, I'll do research, I'll do consulting, but back again, I was there selling. And my first three, four months in Delhi were phenomenally hilarious, okay, because I was required to make cold calls. I called three or four large corporate lawyers and the phone used to just get you know, bashed on you within, within five to 10 minutes. Uh, the biggest uh, learning I had in the first four months is when I ended up doing my first six months, out of the first 10 meetings I do, did, uh, four meetings were got on the context of us coming from Kodak instead of Kotak. Okay. Well, in 2001, the brand Kodak in Delhi was practically unknown. Okay. So it was practically saying I've come from Kodak. The remaining four meetings came through because the clients thought we represented a security company. Okay. Security company as in guards. Okay. Because the company used to be called Kodak Securities. Okay. So it was, it was really hilarious. But uh, from that time, the industry started growing. Okay. In 2001, is when wealth management as an industry in India started. And I ended up being a massive beneficiary of that between 2001 to 2005. Okay. Now I didn't choose this for myself. I got lucky in some ways, right? Because I, what I chose was to become a high flying consultant working with the McKinsey equivalent in Barcelona, but ended up doing a sales job in an industry, which was growing by leaps and bounds between 2001 to five. And that really in some ways shaped a lot. 2007 end, when we decided to become professional entrepreneurs, as we so call it, uh, you know, we pretty much put in our papers on 3rd January 2008. We again managed to capture the peak because that was the peak of the market. And we started business in April 2008. Again, we thought we've done the dumbest thing ever. But again, in retrospective, we realized, retrospect, we realized we're extremely, extremely lucky. We are lucky because uh, uh, we became very modest. Okay? We were extremely modest when we set up business. We were extremely modest in our capacity building. We were extremely modest about our recruitments. We were extremely modest about the rentals we were paying. And we were mostly, very, very importantly, modest about the expectations we set for ourselves. And that modesty, and to a certain extent, an increased focus on client centricity, uh, became a kind of a, a winning edge in the market. Okay? So to a lot of, you know, lot of uh, attribution, to the word luck. You have to be there at the right place at the right time. You can't choose everything. But uh, I'll sign off on, on this word luck um, with a small uh, anecdote. Okay, uh, I was discussing with a lot of my office colleagues around about three, four months back and I was giving them a similar example. I said, if, if it's if so much about luck, why aren't all of us equally successful in the office? Okay, And then we started because the 65% which you're talking about, which is the industry, all of us are part of the same industry. 15% uh, is about the uh, 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 about the company, okay, which platform you represent. 10% potentially could be the uh, platform and the people you work with. And the remaining last 10% is essentially each individual's effort. Okay? And I think that 10% varies from individual to individual. 
And the good thing and the bad thing about this piece of luck is the first 90 can be equal for everybody. But if the last 10 is different for each individual, it kind of plays out extremely, extremely different. And uh, currently, you know, the world we live in, the 90 can be same for everybody. But if the last 10 is different for the others, uh, you end up having very, very different scales of success within the platform. So that in some, some ways, uh, I would kind of uh, uh, call as luck. Uh, third, uh, in my mind, is uh, the entire word called expectations and emotions. Okay? I think these, these two are extremely, extremely critical in the marketplace. Um, expectations, because we need to be really, really sensible about what we are after. Uh, expectations, many, many cases can be either built out of education or built out of experience. Okay? Um, it's built out of education because you realize, you read over a period of time, you understand that you can't expect more than what is possible. Because if you get your expectations wrong, you're only going to end up burning yourself, okay? Because it's not going to be possible. So very often I have, uh, I have discussions with a lot of my clients who are businessmen. And uh, uh, they ask me, you know, we, we often discuss their businesses. And then we get into a very uh, interesting discussion where we say that uh, what is the return on equity of your business okay, versus investing. So you get into a discussion with a businessman who says, you know, I have 100 rupees in my business, uh, stuck in my business, which I'm rotating every year. Uh, on that business, I end up earning around about 18 to 20% post paying my taxes. Okay? So 18 to 20 rupees is my post tax return on my business. What can you make on my investments? Okay? And then I go and tell them you can make 9 to 10% on your investments okay so you think why should i invest why shouldn't i invest everything in my business okay the answer to that is very very different right because your expectation from your investments versus your business is very different in your own business you're spending 24 hours okay you're eating sleeping drinking your business you are dealing with the tax man you're dealing with the laborers you're dealing with the factory at all points of time you're stressed you're taking a lot of counterparty risk you're dealing with suppliers you are giving credit the quantum of risk which you take in your business while you do your business is dramatically different from the quantum of risk you take while investing. Okay. While investing, obviously, you follow a certain process. Uh, the money is liquid at all points in time. You don't have a counterparty risk. You're dealing with the exchange. If you sell something on the exchange, the money has to come to you. The risks are very, very different. Okay. And it is that portion of money which is represented for outside your business. Okay. So effectively, the moment you start investing, and ex start expecting a return of 18 to 20% very similar to your business. That's really where the problem will start. You'll end up taking risks which you don't understand. The risk might eventually lead to a return, but the volatility in between might kill you. And therefore it might not ever end up resulting in the same return. And linked with this topic is this entire word called emotions, right? Because emotions more often than not get the better of us. Uh, irrespective of who we think we are, we are extremely, extremely uh, 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 emotional people. Uh, and you know, irrespective of how much wealth you have, okay, uh, you hate when you lose a large quantum of money. At that point of time, the absolute amount of money starts playing at your head. And when the market is going up, okay, the worst thing you, the worst feeling you have is you are not making money, and your neighbor is making money. Okay, so both sides you feel extremely, 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 extremely horrible. And uh, that entire cycle of fear and greed and hope keeps playing itself over and over again. Extremely difficult to, to kind of uh, uh, keep your emotions in control and in check, but education and experience put together teach you not to be too emotional about the markets. The third and the fourth point is really around uh, uh, asset allocation. Uh, now asset allocation is, is a word which you all would have heard many times, but the importance of asset allocation cannot be, uh, cannot be uh, overstated, okay? It's the most, most important uh, parameter which finally influences the return of the portfolio. Uh, analysts, scientists, um, data crunchers, like all of us over the last 40, 50 years, have finally reached a conclusion where more than 80 to 85% of your final return can be attributed to asset allocation and less than 15 to 20% can be attributed to timing and instrument selection. Okay. So 80 to 85% of your return only comes out of one, one single decision. How much do you decide to invest in equity? How much do you decide to invest in fixed income? And how much do you decide to invest in real estate? Okay. This, this essentially makes up 80% of your portfolio return. I want to give you a classic example. Okay. Um, 
2001 joined Kodak, was extremely successful there. Got an opportunity to move to Bombay in 2005. Did extremely well for myself. Ended up uh, earning a fairly large portion of what is uh, what you all, a lot of you would have heard of is employee stock options. Okay, uh, 2007 December uh, when I when I left Kodak. Uh, I'll give you a classic example, okay? And I'm giving you this example because today Kodak's a very, very large bank, right? Uh, even in 2007, it was already a very large bank. It got its license in 2005. I left uh, December end. I left Kodak at that point of time. I had around about 20,000 options of uh, Kodak Bank. Uh, Kodak Bank shares at that point of time were around about 1,300 rupees. Uh, equivalent was around about 2.6 crores, okay? Uh, so that was, my, that was pretty much representing 95% or 98% of my wealth at that point of time. I took a small loan of 25 to 30 lakhs to invest in a, a business started by a relative of mine. And I still remember the discussion the first week of January with my wife who said, who told me, do not take a loan on your investments. Okay, uh, Do not take a loan. She reminded me at least three times. I told her, you know, it's 25 lakh rupees on an investment of 2.6 crores. Okay, You will never get a margin call. This is hardly called taking a loan. You're borrowing less than 10% of your value. Okay, and as life was to have it that year, uh, for all those who don't know, the market obviously went through the entire GFC crisis, which is the global financial crisis. And even a bank like Kotak, okay, which was extremely large, extremely sound, nothing happened to it in 2008. But eventually the stock market sometimes, for a short period of time, can become an interplay between demand and supply, and not only about the right valuation. Okay? And at that point of time, your ability to manage that volatility becomes the driver of your ability to hold on to that position or not. So even though you might be holding the best quality instrument, your ability to hold to that instrument might not be really there. During that phase of nine months from January that year to round about five days before Diwali that year, I remember very clearly, would have been somewhere between late October to mid-November, the price of Kodak Bank came down from around about 1300 rupees to a low of 117 rupees. So it came down to a low of around about 90 it lost 91% of its value. Okay? So it came down to 9% of its peak value. Okay. Now what, what can happen is only three things, right? Um, I am God and I sell it at 1300, which doesn't happen. Okay. Um, once it goes down to 600, I start believing that it's come down too much. Uh, I still want to hold on to it because I've already seen a 1300. At 450, 475, this entire thing is worth now only 65, 70 lakhs, right? And remember, I had a loan of 30, 35 lakhs. Okay. So I need to now sell my position because if it goes below 450, 475, I will not have enough money to pay the lender. Okay. So at 450, 475, I'm forced to sell. Now, whether I believe it's a good stock to own at 450, 475 or not, really doesn't matter because I need to sell it at 450, 475. Now, assume I didn't have a loan. Okay. At, then there will be only three scenarios which could play out. One, I hold it forever, okay, which means uh, it goes from 1300 to 117. If I circle forward today in 2020, which is 11 years ahead, the same stock would be around about 4,200 rupees. Okay? So the same stock has gone from 1300 rupees to 117 rupees and 117 rupees to 4,200 rupees. Okay? Now, if you had 100% of your wealth okay, in this one stock, you could not have either seen 117 because at some point between 1300 to 117 you would have lost patience and you would have sold your shares because you would have said i i already lost 50 percent of my wealth i can't really see it if you would have not sold it then and let's say it reached 117 you definitely won't sell it because it was worth nothing you definitely will sell it on the way up okay if it reaches 600 you'll be god i've seen it gone down to 10 percent. let me at least sell it when i've got back 50 percent if you're super smart you would have definitely held on to it, but you would have surely sold it as soon as it came back to 1200 because you, you would have said, I've seen 90% of this get wiped out. Now my entire capital has come back. Let me get rid of it now. If you expect to be an individual who will sell at 1300, buy at 100 and still hold it at 4200, we are all dreaming, okay? Because that doesn't exist, okay? And the only thing, the only thing which can enforce and allow us not to take these rash and brash decisions is to do your asset allocation well. Uh, we obviously manage money for ultra high net worth individuals. Uh, so they obviously end up with a large amount of money. 
but typically most of our clients have 50 to 60 percent on the fixed income side 35 30 to 35 percent on the equity side and five to seven percent in real estate so that keeps the volatility of the portfolio extremely extremely low okay um, so extremely critical have your asset allocation in place uh, never get tempted um, returns beyond normal don't exist okay uh, the last point i want to make is uh, or the last variable i want to deal with is risk okay and this is an extremely extremely important word uh, obviously needless to say and i can tell all of you uh, more and more education ensures that we take less and less risk okay uh, we get in tuned to be not able to take risk okay so i'll again quote from my personal example obviously when i got out of campus in 2001 money was extremely important we all had to support our families so salary was the most important thing pay back the education loan um, and obviously work hard and get a bonus okay and i did this in delhi for four years between 2001 to 2005 and i must tell you delhi is a good place to live sometimes a uh, lot of pollution but it has no experience about capital markets okay so 2001 to 5 i pretty much worked in capital markets without learning anything about capital markets 2005 i moved to bombay uh, with kodak and the two years between 2005 to 7 uh, i first time really learned about capital markets and wealth management and in in those years in 2000 to 2009 all the way till uh, the global financial crisis used to be a very very uh, sales driven job okay so practically uh, you had incentives okay for getting a certain amount of revenue to the firm okay it was not only about advice it was also about getting revenue to the firm it was a very distribution based business today it's changed to an advice based business but those days it used to be a distribution based business so basically the the way the maths to cut it short the way the maths used to work is uh, if you earn 100 rupees of revenue for the firm your salary approximately used to be around about 10 to 15 rupees okay or let's say around about 10 rupees the firm on the 100 rupees you earn for them essentially will pay you around about 15 to 20 rupees okay so if your salary is 10 you'll earn the remaining 5 or 10 rupees as variable bonus okay now on you earning this 20 rupees the firm is spending a little more money right the firm is spending uh, more money on your boss your super boss on branding on the platform on getting the product team right and so on and so forth so typically most firms end up spending another 30 rupees on all these associated costs okay so typically on 100 rupees of revenue i was earning 15 to 20 rupees the firm was earning uh, the firm was spending another 30 to 35 rupees okay so remaining 50 rupees essentially represented profit to the firm on my 15 rupees what i was earning i was paying tax and therefore i was ended ending up with a profit after tax for myself of around about 10 rupees the firm was earning 50 rupees and paying tax again of 30 percent or 40 percent and ending up with about 30 rupees post tax okay so on the 100 rupees of income i was earning 10 and the firm was earning 30. i was at peace with this okay because this really made a lot of sense because i was allowed when i took leave for a month uh, you know once i took a leave for one one whole month i could do that i had some great off sites to go to i made some great friends at work I could take a 15 day leave hand over my work to somebody else and go and party that was also okay and then then i made 10 and then i made 30 okay i always believed if i went out on my own and tried to do this i would not be made, able to make more than 10 because i wouldn't have the backing of the entire firm the platform and so on and so forth come bombay i realized that uh, promoters and entrepreneurs don't work for that 30 rupees okay they work for something else the in the markets the 30 rupees essentially gets multiplied by something called a p multiple okay that's how the stock is valued okay so in my case kotak bank at that point of time was valued at around about 25 to 30 times earnings right so the earnings was 30 rupees and the appreciation of the stock price was effectively 30 into 25 okay which was essentially 750 rupees okay now suddenly the equation changed from 10 is to 30 to 10 is to 750 okay and that was the day i decided this equation is not fair i need to move and go to the opposite side of the table where i move from an employee to an entrepreneur okay and uh, that's really what in some ways um, drove my decision uh, to get into a, what we later started calling as a professional entrepreneurship uh, because and we call it professional entrepreneurship 
because we were not diehard courageous. Uh, we went out and uh, formed a kind of a subsidiary with IFL in which all of us employees owned around about 35-40% and IFL itself owned 60-65% for giving us the uh, capital and platform on day one. Uh, it kept us uh, it kept us honest, it kept us modest and most importantly it gave us a platform to start for because otherwise in financial services the need for capital can be very very large. Uh, so we did exactly the reverse of what most of the startups do today. Uh, we went up and diluted on day one and ended up owning a smaller percentage of a uh, uh, business. Uh, most startups start on their own today and then keep raising capital over the next uh, seven to eight years and therefore end up getting diluted. But we did exactly the opposite because we believe strongly uh, that if we can start with owning 35-40% but with sufficient capital, we'll most probably end up owning uh, a large portion uh, of, a, of a, 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 a larger portion, a smaller portion of a larger business as opposed to owning a larger portion of a smaller business. And uh, for us, uh, you know, it's worked out well. Um, we recently got listed in the exchanges a year back. And we, as the doctor said, we managed uh, close to around about uh, 180,000 crores and spread across around about five and a half, six thousand families. So that's really, uh, friends, my, my journey. A long way to go. We are all relatively young, uh, uh, early 40s, and hopefully uh, can keep going strong for the next 15, 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bhagat. Uh, that was a very uh, insightful uh, uh, talk, I would say. Um, and I would like to just quickly summarize on what you just spoke in the last 30 minutes or so. I think this is one of the very clear uh, uh, description of the word clear itself. Uh, and I think there was a very good chron chronology to be uh, you know, followed. Uh, so C was compounding in commercial for all the viewers. Uh, luck, uh, which is L. Uh, obviously, looking at the environment and the industry uh, where you're working at, uh, which also includes modesty and client uh, centricity, expectations and emotions, uh, which is you are mindful about what, uh, you know, we are after and also very clear expectations of business investment, which should be different. Uh, asset allocation, which is A, uh, which is the most important aspect. Uh, right asset uh, allocation keeps the volatility uh, low and risk, which is... Um, uh, more education, less risk-taking ability, sales-driven, uh, which helped uh, uh, you sort of uh, take on this path. And obviously, more capital was important than the percentage of equity. So that is a quick snapshot of thank you, thank uh, uh, That's what a great you just topic. said. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I think that was the fastest uh, three minutes conversion I could do for a 30-minute talk. Um, I, I hope that was probably uh, slower than the money conversion. We'll move on to the question-answers uh, round. Um, I have a few questions that have come in and I think uh, this is one of the questions that I want to ask you is uh, fiscal stimulus of 20 lakh crore has been provided to the country. Stock market still does not have a big spike. What are the reasons to revive and boost the economy and the GDP? Uh, is investing in startups the best option for investors? This comes from uh, one of our students, Akash Rathi from our third year undergraduate batch. Thank you, thank you, Akash. I think uh, I think the market's a little confused still about the fiscal stimulus because the devil's obviously in the detail. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of earlier payments have also got included in the stimulus, so obviously those those can't get counted as stimulus because in some senses that money was owed by the government to uh, other institutions. But I think uh, what they've really done well, uh, extremely well, is the entire uh, piece on the MSME uh, uh, stimulus where they've granted three lakh crores plus the SOPs to the farmers and so on and so forth will help. Uh, from a market's perspective, I think currently in the extreme short term of the next three to six months, I think uh, we will be more or less uh, a slave. Uh, I can't think of a better word, but we will be a slave to the global markets. Okay? Uh, eventually, uh, a large part of the uh, flows and the demand of supply of stocks for India comes out of the overseas markets. And uh, I think India will be relatively resilient and we should outperform as we outperformed in the crisis in 2008-9. But I think the markets will look forward and uh, I would not expect an immediate knee-jerk recovery. I think businesses are suffering and uh, consumption will take 12 to 18 months to come back and uh, demand for stocks will also take some time. So I would look uh, westward uh, for, uh, 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 for getting a clearer direction from the markets. As far as your question on investing in startups goes, uh, similar feedback, it will take a much longer time for startups to uh, build their business model, monetize, 
in case you have a much longer horizon of five, seven, ten years, only then you can really look at investing in startups. Because, uh, like I said earlier, instant gratification will become even tougher to get in these kind of markets. So I think uh, if markets do go down around that eight, eight and a half thousand levels uh, from a price to book, price to earnings multiple perspective, uh, if you come into the markets below eight and a half thousand over a period of three years with 90% probability you should make money. Uh, it doesn't mean it's the lowest point of the market uh, that nobody knows. But if you keep investing a little bit below eight and a half thousand, your probability of making uh, excess money will be the highest. I would be a little more uh, conservative now and invest in some large cap listed equities as opposed to going to startups. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, the next question is, uh, there's this quote by Thomas Jefferson saying, I find the harder I work, the more luck I seem to have. Uh, do you believe in this? This is by uh, Preet Sangvi from one of our uh, undergrad students. No, 100, 100%. I think there's no doubt about that. I think, uh, like I said earlier, uh, uh, it's all about probabilities, guys. So, you know, uh, the, the, the quantum of hard work influences your probability of being lucky, right? So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not possible, right? Because let's say if, uh, how do I put it? If there are 100 marbles and one marble has a price, uh, uh, if you, and let's say each marble takes one hour to find, if you work 100 hours, your probability of getting lucky in finding the marble is close to 100%. Uh, if you work only for one hour, your probability of finding the marble is 1%. Right? So obviously, there's a massive difference in the probability of getting lucky. There can be one instance where you pick the first marble and you get lucky. But I think uh, the chances of that are much more remote. I think uh, Professor Utsav uh, has a question for you. Professor Utsav, yes. Yeah, hi. Am I audible, Aditya? Yes, yes. Perfect. So, sir, one of the so, you know, a lot of students do come and ask us, uh, which are the top three sectors that you know you're going to be seeing performing in the near future? Which are the you know three sectors which will not perform perhaps that well in the future, sir? Uh, can we have your uh, point of view on which sectors do you think will you know underperform and which sectors will outperform? Sorry, I'm just charging my. So I think the sectors which will remain a little challenged in the short term will be anything which has uh, any sector which needs uh, funding on its balance sheet. Uh, so any sector which needs to kind of borrow money um, in order to uh, grow and therefore has capital as an input uh, will get challenged a bit. Uh, that includes banks, NBFCs. Uh, obviously, within each of these sectors, there will be some uh, uh, some some banks and NBFCs which get access to capital irrespective of how the environment is. So for example, if you look at HDFC bank within the banking side, or you look at Bajaj Finance, for them the uh, input, which is capital, is still readily available. Some other banks and NBFCs may find a much larger challenge in uh, getting access to that capital. And if you don't have access to that capital easily, that's really where the challenges come in, because uh, in more ways than one, um, you know, that's, that's the fodder of the business. On the side on which businesses will end up doing well, I think uh, in India, one thing which keeps coming back faster than everything else is consumption. Uh, so we have very strongly uh, domestic consumption driven market. Uh, so businesses which have uh, surplus cash on their balance sheets, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and are largely driven out of consumption needs in the country, I think we'll see the first uh, cut of recovery. Now, they, some of these have not even fallen that much, whether it's a Hindustan Lever, Britannia, Nestle, Maruti, to a certain extent, will be businesses which are sitting on large amount of cash on their balance sheets and uh, may not represent deep value, but will continue to do fairly well for the next six to 12 months. Please remember if you're buying deep value, uh, what is cheap can become cheaper. Okay, that doesn't mean you made a wrong decision because you can't buy it at the cheapest point, but you can buy it at the right point. Uh, what is cheap will, may take much longer to come back to the right price than what you anticipate, okay? So as long as you remember these two things, uh, there's no problem in going and buying something which is deep value. But uh, when you buy something deep value, you have to be very, very well prepared uh, that you have the right amount of uh, patience and time for the right value to be discovered. All right, so the next question is, um, if you could give us a bird's eye view of uh, what is the state of the market uh, considering the current uh, COVID-19 crisis? 
So I think from a market perspective, uh, we look at it slightly differently. So, you know, in some ways, we believe the COVID crisis is uh, is not the uh, it's not the only cause in itself. Okay, so if you look at the markets over the last 40, 50 years, I'm going to make it relatively simple. But there are two two big benchmarks to look at. One is the price to earnings multiple, and the second is the price to book. Okay, uh, I'll just focus on price to earnings for a minute. So typically, if you draw a normal distribution curve for the market, uh, it quotes at a price to earnings of 17 to 20 times for 85% of the observation periods. Okay? So for in a normal curve, if you draw it, 85% of the observations are captured within the curve. There'll be 10% of the observations on the right side of the curve, 5% of the observation on the left side of the curve. Obviously, there are more observations on the right side of the curve because people are in general speaking more optimistic. So what we strongly believe is we are invested between the 17 to 20 times, okay? which is where the 85% probability is. Okay? So that's where our ability to make uh, superior returns to fixed income is the highest. Okay? Now, let's assume if somebody has 100 rupees of uh, money to be invested in the markets, let's say 100 rupees just for equities. Okay? I'm forgetting the fixed income portion. If the markets are between 17 to 20 times, we are most likely to be invested close to 100. Okay. Now, once it starts exceeding 20, we'll slowly knock off 5, 10% every time. Okay? If the market multiples move to 21, we'll get 100 down to 90, 90 down to 80. Now, where can the markets go to 30 times? The answer is yes. Nobody knows how much it can go. So that's a function of demand and supply. 2007, December, the markets were at 28 times. Okay? So if you started selling at 21 times, you were feeling a little miserable because you've sold a part of your portfolio cheaper than the peak. But remember, none of us can decide where the peak is. Okay? Similarly, on the fall, when the markets start falling below 17 times, you need to start coming back a little, 5-5% five, five you need to keep adding. In 2009, from 28 times, it went to 9 times. Okay? Now, 28 was also not right. 9 was also not right. When you're buying at 14 times, you don't know 9 is going to be the bottom. And when you're selling at 22 times, you don't know 27 is going to be the peak but if you make it a discipline and you operate between that 17 to 20 there is practically 99 percent probability okay, that you'll cut your risk okay and you'll make superior returns to fixed income you will not make the highest return okay because the highest return doesn't exist okay? if you chase the highest return you'll end up with no return okay? so you can make the right return with consistency rather than make the highest return All right uh, I think this is one last question uh, we'll take. Uh, with the gold prices being extremely volatile, do you think it can still be considered as an overall portfolio hedge for a small-time investor? See, gold gold is always can be looked at about as a hedge, right? Because uh, as they say, unlike uh, dollars, which the Fed can keep printing, uh, they can't uh, forcefully discover gold, right? So I think it is going to be a natural hedge. Uh, but uh, you know, it's given where the prices are right now for gold. Again, it's absolutely out, whacked out of the 85% uh, uh, range, right? It is in the outside on the right side of the 10% range. Okay? Uh, so we have to remember that uh, there is a less than 15, 20% probability that it will give you an exceedingly good return from here. Okay? Uh, there is an 85 to 90% probability that from these levels it'll end up being an underperforming asset, okay? Do you want to protect yourself for that 10-15% chance where the world goes for a toss and we move into a Great Depression kind of scenario, which is not looking like, and I would put less than a 10-15% probability to it. But if you want to protect yourself for that 10% probability, then surely go out and buy some gold, okay? But uh, is it going to be an instrument of superior return? Uh, the answer is no. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of the question answers. Uh, 